Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Bank OZK Second Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question-and-answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. Should you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your host, Tim Hicks. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Tim Hicks, Chief Credit and Administrative Officer for Bank OZK. Thank you for joining our call this morning and participating in our question and answer session. In today's Q&A session, we may make forward-looking statements about our expectations, estimates, and outlook for the future. Please refer to our earnings release, management comments, and other public filings for more information on the various factors and risks that may cause actual results or outcomes to vary from those projected in or implied by such forward-looking statements. Join me on the call to take your questions are George Gleason, Chairman and CEO, Brandon Hamlin, President, Greg McKinney, Chief Financial Officer, and Cindy Wolf, Chief Banking Officer. To make the most efficient use of the time we have for this call, we'd ask that you please limit your questions to one or two at a time and then re-enter the queue for any follow-up questions if needed. We will now open up the lines for your questions. Let me ask our operator to remind our listeners how to queue in for questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Again, that's star 1 on your touchtone telephone to ask a question. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Zerby of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Ken. Uh, with, with hoping we can start off, uh, George, I think in your, in your um, sort of prepared written remarks, you talked about total loan growth and RESG potentially starting to grow again in fourth quarter. I know payoffs have been just such a headwind over the last several years. Are, is the comments designed to say that or suggest that payoffs could actually start to slow in fourth quarter? Um, I mean, could we really be seeing a, a turnaround that those are starting to end in a, in a big way? Um, Ken, no, I don't think that's a uh, proper interpretation. I think, you know, payoffs will continue to uh, to be high. And um, I think the uh, uh, more uh, appropriate interpretation is to uh, think about uh, origination volumes beginning to increase uh, in a meaningful way. Um, I spent six weeks on the road uh, during the second quarter visiting uh, the vast majority of uh, our major RESG markets and, and almost all of our origination team members out there. We had scores of uh, customer meetings and interactions and uh, looking at projects. So we're, uh, we're pretty optimistic about our ability to begin to achieve higher origination volumes that will offset the uh, uh, the elevated uh, uh, repayments that we are experiencing now because we're getting repayments that you know naturally would have occurred last year, but for delays from the COVID pandemic, pandemic plus uh, uh, repayments that would naturally have occurred this year. Uh, you know, I think we we originate construction and development loans, so repayments are going to be a uh, a common part of the business. Now, obviously, we've got a um, uh, higher level of accumulated prepayments this year than normal just because of the uh, COVID-related delays in project completion, construction, sales, leasing, refinancing last year. Uh, but uh, we're going to continue to have to uh, uh, um, originate more to offset the fact that all of our loans in that construction and development book pay off. So we're we're focused on growth. We've got a great franchise. Uh, our franchise has proven itself now through the Great Recession, proven itself through the uh, pandemic. Our customers know they can count on us and rely on us that we're always going to be there for them. 
And um, I think we've got a chance to really uh, grow our business over the next several years. And, and uh, the, the six weeks on the road during this last quarter that I spent with our origination team out there certainly uh, suggests that, uh, you know, late 2021, 2022, 2023, we can take our RESG business to a, uh, a more significant level than we've we've taken it in the past because the opportunities seem to be there. And, of course, Brandon's going to go on the road uh, and do a lot of the same sort of uh, networking that I did in coming quarters, and I, I think all of that work with our origination team is, is going to uh, help produce an increasing volume of business, certainly next year, and hopefully we'll see some of that begin to filter through in Q4. Got it. Okay, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, and then just one, my one follow-up question: um, in terms of the net interest margin, obviously we had a you saw you had a very good increase there, and it, it seems that some of it may have been driven by unusually high, you know, minimum interest collections, et cetera, um, but also lower deposit costs. When you think about the NIM on a go-forward basis from here, is should we expect the lower deposit costs to continue to drive the NIM higher, or how, how should we think about the trajectory of, of margin. Thank you. Uh, I, I would suggest that uh, we're at or near a peak on the NIM probably in the near term. Um, you know, we commented in our management comments that we're originating loans at lower rates than the uh, rates that were earned on loans last quarter. That is unfortunately a, a part of this very uh, – liquid, low-rate environment in which we find ourselves uh, yields on all sorts of financial instruments and loans are lower than they were and probably lower than they should be, but it's part of the uh, environment. So as loans roll off, we're not able to replace those yields with equal yields. Uh, we are being diligent to not sacrifice our credit standards and structure standards that we've adhered to for a long time that are the hallmark of our great asset quality. But we are having to get more aggressive on price to uh, uh, not only replace assets that are rolling off, but also grow assets. So uh, growth is important. Pricing is a bit negotiable in here. Um, so uh, loan yields are probably uh, almost certainly headed lower We've got room, Cindy can talk about this later in detail, we've got room to continue to lower our deposit costs for a while to some extent. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think there will be, you know, some pressure on core spread and some pressure on them. We did benefit in quarter just ended from, um, uh, you know, a very good level of minimum interest and, and loan fees, and I noticed several of the, uh, research reports uh, uh, on our on our results noted that we didn't quantify that, and the reason we didn't quantify that is it's hard to know what normal. You know, some quarters that's nine or ten million dollars, some quarters it's three or four million dollars, and it bounces around all over the place. We were on the high end of the range this quarter. We could be, you know on the low, the middle, or the high end of the range for the next few quarters. It's, it just depends on a lot of things that are hard to know when particular loans pay off and, you know, is it this quarter or next quarter and so forth. So we didn't quantify, but we were on the high end of that. So that naturally alone will have some um, pressure on, uh, on loan yields in Q3 and, um, uh, uh, you know, the key is going to be our ability to continue to offset that pressure with uh, reducing deposit costs, and the guys are doing a real lab. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Long-term, Ken, growth is the key. <laughs> Understood. All right, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tamir Brasler of Wells Fargo. Your question, please. Hi, good morning. 
George, maybe just following up on, on your last comment that long-term growth is the key, it, it seems like RESG, indirect RV, RV Marine, ADL, CDSG all converge in 22. I guess what does the near-term growth rate look like in 22 and then once RESG is fully normalized with payoff, payoffs kind of stabilizing and originations starting to pick up again, what does that growth rate look like? Well, tomorrow I think I'll let Brandon Hamlin address that because Brandon, you know, is our president, but he oversees RESG and our corporate and business specialties group and our uh, um, new asset-based lending group. So he's got a pretty good perspective uh, firsthand on most of that. So, Brandon, you want to take that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. Good morning. Um, you know, p picking a normalized growth rate is a little bit fine uh, point to make, but what I would tell you is from RESG's perspective, and, and George alluded to this, um, we're seeing very good pipeline activity. We're, we're uh, very, very strong there, and, and our conversion, uh, you know, our, our wins of what's available out there is starting to pick up. So, I, you know, I, I'm – I'm uh, uh, expecting the, the back half of the year for originations in RESG to, to uh, be definitely moving in the right direction um, and, and back toward and beyond uh, what we've historically done. Now, you, you guys know it's a construction loan portfolio, and what you close today, uh, when you've got 50% average loan to cost, it takes a while to get those dollars out. Um, so while we will have, uh, you know, we've, we've – We've uh, included, again, the, uh, the graph on page 7 of the comments that really gives you a sense of what's left from the legacy portfolio that's outstanding and, 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 and therefore, what's left to pay down. So back to Ken's earlier question, you get a real sense of what, the, what that cycle is going to look like. So we'll still have some payoffs, but um, I'm, I'm seeing really good growth opportunities in the, on the origination side that will start to – to, uh, and, and, and we have obviously uh, weren't sitting on our hands in 2019 and 2020, so some of those loans, you know, starting to, to, to hit with funding will help as well to, to offset or, or at least in part, you know, these, these payoffs that will keep, keep coming in, in, in the, the, the velocity that you see on page 7 uh, following the originations in the natural life cycle. In, in, in our... Uh, uh, new a, a, a asset-based lending group. Um, excited again, as, as I mentioned last quarter, about that, the addition of that team, and and that team uh, is is uh, growing. We're adding incrementally, um, and 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 look forward to having uh, we think some really uh, solid players in in our our probably. Uh, Texas and, and Georgia markets first is, is what we, we think is going to happen there. And, and uh, uh, Mike Sheff, who leads that, that group, is in addition to, to, to building the team and the infrastructure to, uh, toward originating his first loan, is very active in the market and we, as well. And I, I expect that those guys will, um, uh, you know, start to, start to originate probably, probably the first closings in, in Q4, or early Q4, possibly get one in um, in the Q3, but but the opportunities that they're seeing out there and the ge geography that they're covering, um, I'm I'm feeling good about those guys really contributing to our growth. Um, you know they'll they'll start uh, you know at a moderate pace, but 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 I think you know gather steam. Um, pretty pretty good towards the back half of 2022 and 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 keep going in 2023. I I, I think there's good potential for originating some really solid credits in that world. Um, and, you know, our, our, our CBSG group um, uh, is, is as, as we noted, going to have uh, some headwinds early on, but they're, you know, building a base and uh, getting competitive and originating, you know, some, some new stuff with new, uh, new borrowers there. So, uh, we'll, we'll see that accelerate as well. So, tomorrow it's hard to it's hard to circle a number, but I, I can tell you that that the uh, the uh, the outlook is is positive across all three of those groups, um, and and I think RESG is the big driver there. Um, we're, we're looking forward to getting back to you know what, what we've seen in previous years. There, we think that the volume is there. Um, and 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 we're we're out there trying to haul it in and, and having some good success now. 
Okay, and that's helpful. Thank you. I would add, I would add that, uh, you know, we are gaining in a very steady and consistent manner traction with our uh, indirect lending group and the new business model that we rolled out about a year ago now or almost a year ago there in that unit, and we really like the way that's performing. We're going to, uh, we think, be able to protect our asset quality while paying low pre- lower premiums and getting better uh, better spreads. Now, given where rates are, we may get better spreads, but that might not translate into better rates right now just because of how low every everything is. And our community bank is also uh, uh, getting some traction, I think. So, uh, you know, growth will continue to be a challenge and, and outstanding, certainly through Q3. I hope that we'll have a positive growth number in Q4. And uh, I think, uh, as Brandon said, there's a lead time between getting these things closed and beginning to get funding on them. But I think we ought to uh, uh, see a steady progression in uh, our total outstanding balances and and earning assets uh, from the loan side throughout 22 and into the future. And I think we've got all these units uh, going the right direction. Uh, the business model has certainly uh, been proven, and I, I think we've got really good prospects of stepping up to a higher level of origination volume across the company, more diversified also than it's ever been before. Okay, I appreciate the caller. And, and then my follow-up uh, in the release, you had indicated that you're seeing fewer origination opportunities in large urban markets such as New York that are meeting your standards. Is that still few number of deals that are coming online, or are you starting to see some deals come online that aren't necessarily checking your credit box or, or other standards? Well, we always see a lot of deals that don't fit our credit box. Uh, but uh, I will tell you, you know, I uh, – I was in a lot of our major markets. I was in uh, New York. I was in Boston. I was in Chicago. I was in Miami. I was in the uh, Tampa St. Pete area. I was in Phoenix. I was in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver. Uh, I've been in a lot of our markets in this last quarter, and uh, larger mixed-use projects that you know, we've missed the origination on those for the last several quarters just because a lot of those projects got put on hold in the pandemic. There are a lot of those opportunities that uh, look really good, that make a lot of sense, that are coming uh, back to the market now, and we're working a, a good portfolio of those. And we're seeing quite a few other opportunities begin to emerge in those uh, more urban markets that were more significantly impacted by the uh, COVID pandemic shutdowns and, and uh, work from home phenomena. So um, I think things are normalizing and that bodes well for future origination volume. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brock Vander Vliet of UBS. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, it, just on the um, on the deposit uh, dynamics, George, it's great to see uh, what what seems to be something you've talked about for a couple quarters now, really in motion with a a tangible remix, um, declining time deposits in both categories. Um, and as a result, you know, lower lower funding costs. Uh, could you talk, you know, basically, you know, top of the house, wh- what inning are we in in that process, and more granularly, where you think um, your total deposit costs or interest costs could settle out by, you say, year end? Well, uh, Brock, I want to give credit where credit is due on that. Uh, Cindy Wolf, our chief banking officer, is on the phone, so I'm going to let Cindy answer that question. But Cindy has, has built a great team under her that includes uh, Carmen McLennan, our chief retail banking officer, and Adi Curley, our chief deposit officer, and a number of other key players. And, and they are doing really a good job. I'm going to advise Cindy to not try to tell you what inning we're in, but just give you color on uh, 
on <laughs> where she thinks we uh, where she thinks we are and are going in our process of transforming our deposit base. So, Cindy, take that one if you would. Sure. Yes. And further, I won't guess what our cost of funds will be at year end. But uh, as you can see on page 14, we have runway left in our CD maturities. So I can I can talk about how that's been going so far, and and it'll. Uh, it, there are indications that, that those trends will continue, and that's that uh, when we went into this um, wave of CD maturities, we expected to retain a certain amount of them based on our historic, well, historical um, performance around retention of CDs and the industry, and we, we uh, actually retained more than this go-round than we thought we would, which we were happy about that. And of course, obviously, they're they're being repriced much lower. So you can you can see that um, in Figure 16, and um, so we'll continue to take advantage of that, not only in lowering cost of funds, but changing our mix of deposits and replacing with uh, core. Got it. And um, and just as a, a follow up, um, I, I noted the comments. Um, you know, closing, selling a branch or two here and there, um, taking out some headcount. Um, you know, wh what's what's kind of going on in that process behind the scenes? Is that sort of a, a, a uh, an interest in kind of stack ranking the profitability of the of the various branches? Well, it is that. Um, it's really no different than the way we've always run our branch network planning. We we look at a number of different factors, but um, I will say that a lot of it is client-driven. We want to be a client-centric bank. So we have all these various consumer channels where our clients uh, prefer to interact with us, whether it's over the phone, over a mobile device, online, and, of course, in branches. So as long as our clients want our branches and, and they're keeping them busy, then we, we want them to have that option. So we're really responding to the market with our with our branch network. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for the color. And I, or Brock, I would add a little color there uh, as well. You know, the COVID pandemic, uh, Cindy and her team responded really aggressively and updated our mobile banking apps a couple of times and. Uh, accelerated some plans we had to improve the uh, look, feel, functionality, uh, performance of those apps. They worked closely with our technology team to, you know, improve the uh, the speed and reliability metrics of that as well. And the uh, all those things were on the drawing board, but the uh, pandemic, uh, which meant that. Uh, you know, our branches were interacting with customers uh, in a different way uh, by appointment only or drive-in only or whatever, uh, pushed uh, those uh, mobile channels out much faster and encouraged customers who might have been slow adopters to be uh, more rapid, uh, aggressive adopters of that technology. And that has uh, changed the uh, dynamics uh, of um, how customers are interacting with these branches. So that that changing customer interaction, increased reliance and utilization of mobile, online, and you know other non-face-to-face technologies, has uh, accelerated. The closure of some of these branches, where we, and most of these are branches situations where we had two or three branches in an area, and we concluded that based on changing customer utilization patterns and increased technology utilization, we could uh, serve our customers effectively with two instead of three, or one instead of two branches in an area. So it, it is helping to. Uh, uh, offset cost, and you've seen that in our fairly muted non-interest expense growth. Uh, those uh, cost saves are going to be very important because we're in an environment now where, uh, you know, a lot of people have changed their working plans and patterns and behaviors following the uh, pandemic and, and the experience they had for a year or so during the pandemic. So 
we're experiencing labor costs, as we mentioned in the management comments, and closing these uh, branches that are no longer needed and eliminating other redundant, inefficient uh, costs in our structure are going to uh, be critically important in our effort to maintain or even improve our best-in-class efficiency ratio. Great. Thank you for the call, George. Thank you. And your next question comes from Catherine Mueller of KBW. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Catherine. I was excited to see the buyback uh, authorization. Just wanted to get your sense as to how active you intend to be, and is it more opportunistic, or is the, the plan initially to, to go ahead and use that whole $300 million? Tim, you want to take that one? Yeah, happy to. Catherine, good morning. Good to hear from you. Good morning. Thanks for a question. Um, yeah, um, obviously this is our first uh, share repurchase authorization that we've done in our company's history. It, it is an authorization that um, has a one-year um, expiration, so it does go through July of next year. Um, you know, I think we'll be have a moderate pace there. I mean, we will be opportunistic. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if our stock price were to go down, we're probably going to be more active. When our stock price goes up, we will be less active. So I think we'll look look for opportunities um, to be opportunistic at a at a moderate pace. I like the win there. That was that was sneaky, Tim. <laughs> um, and then my other question is just on on the growth outlook. This is more just kind of an industry question, just to think about how you know, we keep hearing about supply chain issues and construction costs that are impacting um, new construction projects. How much of that is impacting originations today, and, and what's your sense as to how that kind of moves along as we move through the back half of the year and how that kind of impacts your, um, your growth outlook? Brandon, would you like to address that? Absolutely. Absolutely, and thanks for the question, Catherine. I, I think um, uh, decreasingly so is, is the short way to answer that. Um, you know, as we have uh, moved through the year, uh, there there have been situations where, you know, there are really some impact, but, but nothing outside of the realm of what we're used to dealing with in our 18-year history on construction projects. And and it's you know as to affecting originations um as as George alluded to in, in his travels uh thus far this year and um you know week in week out over the the past quarter you have seen uh opportunities increasingly come to market so it really it really doesn't feel as though uh or any data present itself that would say that there is any material impact there i'm not, you know there there's a cost impact to projects um and and so um there there's a fine tooth pencil that, that that's there right up to the closing projects and there and there from a pure closing the loan perspective uh it may delay that a bit but as as we've alluded to the liquidity in the market um and you know, and some of the um, uh, lowered expectations on the yield of, of some of that money uh, is helping those those capital stacks to absorb you know the, the cost impact, and, um, and and that that cost impact seems to be moderating uh, you know in certain cases. So, um, in in short, deal flow is 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 moving much better uh, as we've as we've moved through the year. So, to the extent that it's been an issue, it's not keeping you know the market from from bringing increasing uh, increasing number of deals and deals that you know are RESG type deals. Um, you know that that came up earlier. I think uh, we're, we're definitely uh, looking at more of those those larger mixed use projects that had been slow out of the box, you know, out of COVID. And so, um, I, you know, I would expect, I mean, my expectation would be anything can happen, but that we'll start to see on average, you know, larger uh, loan amounts as, as we close into the, you know, the back half of this year and, and into 2022. There are a lot of, there are a lot of projects out there, a lot of large projects out there yet to come to the market. And, and of course, our, our capital puts us in a great position to be able to, to bid on those large projects. So, um, hopefully that answers your question. 
Yeah, no, it does. That's great. Um, and then maybe one follow-up, if I could just um, to follow up on the loan yield conversation. It, um, I know it's hard to pinpoint the the fees or the accelerated fees this quarter, but it, could you maybe give us a sense or maybe anecdotes about where new production is coming on today, and the particularly in the RESG book? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's sort of the same story in terms of, of um, you know the, the the product type um, there's been uh, a lot of a lot of residential whether whether multifamily or condo origination going on but we, we continue to have really good diversification uh, across the other product types as well um, you know uh, our footprint geographically uh, is is very well situated to um, enjoy the benefit of a lot of migration trends, uh, you know, in, into in particular the southeast, uh, but also southwest, west. Um, our you know our guys. Uh, there was a question earlier on New York. Um, uh, while while we haven't seen yet the origination pick back up there, the opportunities that we're looking at definitely are, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll be doing more business there. But we've, you know, while that's been slow, the guys, the guys have done a great job of, of penetrating, you know, the Boston market, um, good activity there, uh, the D.C. market. Um, so it's, you know, we, we have a lot of ways that we slice and dice our portfolio for you in our comments, and, and, and what we're seeing is, is is not uh, you know uh, all that different um, from from in in the future uh, origination pipeline from from what we you know said in our comments this quarter we you know we're we're while we haven't been closing the big ones in some of the big markets they're coming to the market and in the meantime we've done a lot of stuff and in some of the other smaller markets so keeping busy closing a lot of loans across a lot of different markets. Um, and, and the you know, same general uh, product types that we've been uh, um, active in in the last couple of quarters. Great. And then, and then pricing on those, on those new ones? Yeah, there, let me take that one. Yeah, let me take that one. It, it, it's all over the board. And, you know, we're, we're trying to diversify more into industrial and, and life sciences because we think that, Further diversification of that RESG portfolio is helpful. That tends to be, um, you know, things that get done at a, a lower margin, tighter pricing. So it, it, it really is all over the board. I think the uh, loans that we've probably uh, 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 had in committee in the last um, six weeks or so, we've probably had a 300 basis point differential between the uh, – lowest approved yields and the highest approved yields. And, you know, it just reflects the product type, the market, the complexity of the transaction, a, a variety of things. We we get to start doing more really complex transactions that, that are not as commodity type transactions that require our expertise and sophistication to execute. We get better pricing on those than we do a plain vanilla apartment deal that, you know, pretty much any any lender can compete for. So it, it's hard to nail down pricing. I would tell you on average the the uh, loan yields we're getting on new originations are less than the yields on the book, and that if that is surprising to uh, anybody, they've been under, under a rock for the last couple of years because the Fed has got the uh, market so liquid that, you know, there's just not the yield out there that there was. So clearly, as we said, a downward pressure on loan yields, we've got to offset that with volume. We've got to offset that uh, with uh, controlling deposit cost and keeping our efficiency ratio really low. So we we understand our game plan on how to address a an environment where there is pressure on uh, loan Pricing, and uh, I like our like our plan, and I like our prospects of being successful with that. Got it. Understood. Thanks for all the color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Skelton of Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Good morning, Stephen. 
Stephen, you may be on mute. To send this message, press pound or hang we'll, up. To we'll go to the next question. To re Our next question comes from the line of Michael Rose of Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. Um, you know, one area that hasn't been hit on yet, uh, George, is, is technology. It's a, it's you know, becoming a big issue. I know you guys have spent a lot of money, um, you know, over the years, you know, moving into new headquarters, systems investments, you know, things like that. But the uh, the, the tax spend continues to move higher, you know, for the industry. Just wanted to get an update on, you know, maybe some things that you're working on and, and maybe how you, you know, would expect to fund them. You guys have been really good on the expense control front after some of those larger investments a couple of years ago. So just wanted to get a broad update on, on the technology efforts and where we stand. Thanks. Hey, Brandon, uh, uh, do you want to take that? Obviously, uh, data innovation and technology now reports to uh, Brandon uh, and has been for a couple quarters. So, Brandon, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll – say that a lot of the efforts have been, and I think we talked about this last quarter, around um, the efficiency of the way we run the operation. And, 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 and George and Cindy alluded to, you know, the, the outward-facing side as well. So it's, it's a two-front war. It's, it's, it's focused on our efficiency internally and um, and, and, you know, and, and, uh, preparation, you know, everything that we do today is focused on what we want to be tomorrow. And, and, um, that's, uh, you know, uh, bigger, better, and, and faster. So we're, we're working on a, uh, a, a initiative that is, that is focused on, uh, bringing some, some, uh, uh, application that was developed initially at RESG and, and, and bringing that into the rest of the organization, um, and, you know, a, a, a Moody's platform at the same time and both working together to, uh, just make, give us the opportunity to be more efficient in the delivery of, of data from one end of the, of the process to the other. Uh, give upper management uh, better insight into uh, what's going on from beginning to end of the process. So th there's a lot of, uh, you know, and then just, you know, managing our data in, in new, new data marts and, and, and new platforms. So efficiency is a big word uh, uh, as it relates to the internal side. And then, you know, Cindy and, 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 uh, and Carmen have, have been working with our labs team, as, as George uh, alluded to, on a number of fronts uh, to move with the market uh, as, as the, the needs and desires and technology change. We want to stay at the leading edge of that um, to, you know, ensure that we are put, putting Cindy and her team in the best possible position to, to move the deposit uh, uh, world where it needs to go. So. Um, you know, we have said many times that we're, we're committed to um, excellence in, in not just our credit, but also uh, our, our efficiency in the, the way we, we serve both customers and, and uh, provide our, our employees with the opportunity to do their, their jobs. So that will, be, um, that will be something we're always focused on. I think everyone on the call understands the speed at which technology is changing, and it's our desire to, to stay up with and, and ahead of that. Uh, at all times. Okay, great. Well, I mean, maybe just, I, yep, let me let me add a little bit to to that. And you know, we really are fortunate to have an excellent uh, technology team, and uh, that whole group now, uh, technology, data, and innovation reports up to Malcolm Hicks, who reports directly to uh, to Brandon, and and uh, we've. Uh, been very effective in the last year, as Brandon said, in delivering uh, quick technology enhancements, upgrades, and solutions. Our labs unit has been very instrumental in that. Those guys, I think, are doing the uh, best work they've ever done. We've gotten a, a very pragmatic, practical, get things done, accomplish improvements sort of focus throughout that uh, group. That, that makes them really uh, effective in helping our company. And uh, we continue to advance on a lot of fronts. So I'm, I'm pleased with where we are. I think your question probably uh, uh, was aimed at 
was were we going to see huge increases in expenditure regarding technology? I think we will see increasing spend, but at a, a, a fairly moderate rate of growth because I think uh, our guys are being very efficient and very pragmatic in how they're approaching this, but we are at the same time advancing our technology capabilities uh, consistently and and I think pretty uh, pretty materially. I, I feel real good about the progress we're making and the cost that we're incurring to uh, make that progress seems very efficient to me. Okay, great. Maybe just as a quick follow-up, you know, the service charges were up this quarter. You know, there's been some headlines out there, some uh, some self-imposed, but also some external pressure on, on NSF fees. I know that's not a big line, you know, for you guys, but is this, um, you know, what, what, A, what drove the increase, and then, you know, B, uh, you know what have what, what steps do you plan to take as it relates to uh, to NSF for uh, for those customers that that have it again? I know it's a small proportion for you, but it has been in the news lately. Thanks. Well, we are uh, you know we're monitoring uh, uh, what uh, uh, political and and regulatory conversations are going on about that subject. It it does uh, seem likely that some changes are in the wind. Uh, ahead, we don't have any uh, significant plans to change anything in the short run, uh, increase or decrease in that regard. Uh, we have seen, particularly the last month or two, a, a, as uh, economies have uh, more fully reopened and uh, people are out spending and so forth, we have seen uh, uh, an improvement in service charge activity and, and part of that is just the uh, philosophical approach that Cindy and her team are taking on uh, deposits and getting more core customers and less uh, interest rate driven customers and those core customers tend to engage in activities that create more service charge revenue. So I would tell you the biggest impact and the improvement in the last quarter was just the normalization of economic activity and reopening. Second to that is is improvement that Cindy and her team are making in the uh, quality and value and profitability of our deposit base. Great. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matt Oney of Stevens, Inc. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll start on the interest-bearing deposit cost. It sounds like there's more room to bring that down in the near term. But I guess from a strategic standpoint, with all the liquidity in the system, I'm just curious if the, if the bank is yet considering locking in longer-term funding uh, in anticipation of higher rates in the future. Sandy, you want to take that? Would you repeat the question, please? Yes, Cindy. I was just asking if if the bank is considering locking in longer term funding uh, in anticipation of higher interest rates. We are. So um, Adi and uh, our chief deposit officer uh, Drew Harper, our uh, managing director of wholesale deposits, have been working on that and are doing some uh, relatively conservative steps to increase duration in our book. We're not going overboard with it, but yes, we are having those conversations and, and making some moves to add duration. Okay. Thanks for that, Cindy. And, and Matt, we're doing that in a cost effective manner. If you I think Cindy uh, pointed out that chart at the bottom of uh, the uh, uh, page there on deposit cost figure sixteen, I think it was and you know, if you look at our new and renewed time deposits in Q2, they were a fraction of one basis point. It actually rounded up instead of down this quarter. They were a fraction of a basis point higher in Q2 than in Q1, and that differential really reflected uh, uh, their efforts to, uh, uh, without materially impacting our cost fund, begin to ladder in some longer duration deposits. Okay, thank you. And then I guess I want to circle back on the discussion around loan fees. And as you said, George, it's not easy to predict where that's going to land any given quarter. 
Um, but it does feel like these fees have been elevated for a, a few consecutive quarters. Is, is that fair? And then for the short-term extension fees in particular, I think that was one of the fees that was mentioned in the management comments. My, my working assumption has been that some of those extension fees are associated with RESG project delays that were driven by the pandemic last year. Is that right? And, and if so, can we assume that some of those projects are, that were delayed are not coming back online and getting back to a normal schedule? And, and so we, should we assume that those extension fees will be lower next year compared to, compared to this year? Thanks. Uh, that, that's probably a fair assumption, Matt. Uh, and, and, you know, again, these kind of extraordinary extension fees, minimum interest, and so forth, I mean, we're talking a range in a low quarter, three or four million dollars a quarter, and a high quarter, you know, eight or nine million dollars, and <clears throat> more typically somewhere in between there. But it, it does just bounce around a lot. So, yes, uh, you're, you're correct that a lot of projects that were delayed, you know, for three to six months by COVID need another three months or six months or four months to uh, get the project uh, completed and and um, sold units closed and the loan paid off or uh, to refinance to the permanent market. And that has been a... Uh, uh, a nice source of, of fee income, particularly the last uh, couple of quarters. We've seen quite a bit of short-term extension fees the last two quarters. And I think we'll continue to see some level of that um, uh, in in the last two quarters of the year and diminishing somewhat next year. And, you know, um, the other fees just tend to, even in normal times, tend to, you know, minimum interest and uh, acceleration of uh, deferred loan origination fees from faster than expected payoffs. Those things tend to just bounce around a lot in good times and bad times. And and uh, um, actually, the acceleration of deferred loan origination fees and minimum interest can have a greater impact in periods where things are going much faster than in, than when uh, refinances and sales are going slow because your projects typically tend to earn up those fees and earn up that minimum interest before they pay off and when things are going slow. So there, it's, it's, it's a very dynamic situation and it's hard to generalize and that's why we we always are hard pressed to give really good guidance on it because it just bounces around a lot from quarter to quarter. We're okay. thankful for them when we earn them though. Let me be clear on that. Sure. Thanks for the color. All right. Thank you. Thank you again to ask a question. Please press star one on your touch tone telephone. Our next question comes from Brian Martin of Janie Montgomery. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Brian. Hey, uh, George, or just to whomever, just uh, maybe it's more Tim, just on the, uh, you talked about just kind of the deployment of capital. I mean, obviously the growth and the buyback you've mentioned, just kind of any update on just how you're incorporating in the M&A uh, you know, commentary, just how that uh, how that's trending today, the opportunities or what you're seeing maybe seems less likely with, you know, the growth that's in front of you that you've already articulated. Tim, you want to talk about that? Yes, happy to. Uh, thanks, Brian, for the question. Um, certainly, as we outlined in the management comments, organic growth is is our number one growth priority. Clearly, we've got a lot of things moving in a positive way there between our RESG, asset-based lending team, our community banking team. If you exclude the PPP loans, our community banking team actually grew this quarter. Um, I think, uh, the, the, no surprise, our Florida and Texas markets did really well in community banking. Um, indirect lending seems to be, um, you know, certainly um, on a positive trend there as well. So, you know, we're... We're focused uh, very heavily on organic growth and, and the opportunities there. Um, obviously, we announced the share repurchase authorization uh, along with our earnings as well. But we're, you know, our appetite is back for for M and A. We're 
looking at opportunities. Um, you know, it, it is a secondary growth opportunity for us to our organic uh, growth opportunity. We, we don't want to do anything that would be of a size that would disrupt the momentum that we have organically. Uh, but we are uh, actively looking and, and um, looking for opportunities. Clearly, our we still believe our stock price is, is undervalued compared to some of the peers and con compared to some of the, uh, the valuations of, of some of the acquisitions that have occurred uh, recently. Um, obviously, the M&A market's uh, very active right now. Um, uh, we would look probably to do something of a size where we could do it for cash or some combination of stock and, and cash. So. Um, a lot of lot of things moving there, but uh, we, you know, that is that is a, a one of our primary focus areas is just how do we um, um, deploy our capital in the best interest of our of our shareholders, and and we're looking at all avenues to do that. Gotcha. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Tim. And then maybe just the how do we think about the kind of the mix of the balance sheet. I mean, I know the securities were up a little bit this quarter, but just given the growth that's in front of you, just kind of how the, the that mix may change as you, you know, go over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, how should we think about that? I think securities were maybe up to 18% or so of, of assets. Maybe, you know, I'm not sure if I have that exactly right, but just up a little bit relative to the past. Brian, I would say, you know, we, we've typically maintained our loan to deposit ratio in that uh, 89 to 99 percent range. We we've been comfortable. We've got all sorts of uh, stress testing and secondary source of liquidity and other things that you know have given us comfort being at that level. We're a little below that right now. Um, I would think that as we get the uh, loan growth going where we want, we'll we'll return back into that 89 to 99 percent range in the uh, in the uh, future. Okay, perfect. And I just sneak one in, just last one for Greg, maybe on the, uh, like you said earlier, George, there's some commentary about the wage inflation, just how the how that may impact expenses, you know, as we go forward here, or just how we should think about that. Thanks. Greg, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I will. Brian, thank you for the question. Um, you know, as we, as we mentioned in our management comments, we have experienced, um, you know, pressure, really broad rates, Broad-based pressure across the U.S., you know, from from wages and and being able to find you know workers uh, to fill all the um, all the uh, the, uh, the the spots here in the bank where we want to have you know and retain our teams and, and make sure that our teams are getting appropriately compensated. So, you know, I think there is going to be pressure from that as we look into the next quarter or two. Uh, how long that uh, continues, you know, that's Probably still to be determined, but um, you know some of the things that uh, you know Cindy and her comments uh, in response to a question about our branches. Some of those things you know we're trying to make sure that we look at you know all of our operations when and make sure we are eliminating any sort of redundancies or inefficiencies, utilizing technology to really help us to the extent we can offset those wage pressures. Um, you know, hopefully we can effectively offset that. Uh, but as we mentioned in our prepared comments, you know that's uh, certainly going to be a challenge, and it's going to be a um, you know uh, probably a driver of increasing um, salary and benefit costs for us over the next couple of quarters. Okay. Hey Brian, Brian, this is Tim, and just uh, we have it in our, our commentary. But just as a reminder for non-interest expense for Q3 specifically, we do have a couple of one-time. Uh, type items that uh, are going to impact Q3 non-interest expense. The the two million dollars of charges we ha are going to expect to incur from the closure of a few branches that we have and scheduled to close in Q3. And then we did redeem our sub debt um, uh, on July 1. Um, that had about 800,000 of uh, of uh, costs that uh, deferred issuance costs that were not amortized yet. That's going to come in in Q3 as well. So just a reminder from that perspective but um, that, that will impact Q3 and um, and not, not future quarters. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for taking the questions, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Scooten of Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good morning. 
Um, so I, I wanted to follow up on the on the capital and just kind of how to think about capital deployment in light of kind of your legal lending limit. And I know um, you know the buy the buyback is a part of it. Maybe you're able to find a deal that's cash or or predominantly cash. And so is the right inference there that you don't need your legal lending limit theoretically to be as high, and we might not see the you know the the bigger commitments, the 400, 500, 600 million return anytime soon, or am I reading too much into that? Uh, you're reading too much into that. Uh, you know, uh, our our legal loan limit now, uh, which we've grown by accumulating a lot of capital in recent years, is a very important part of our strategy to uh, significantly uh, increase our RESG and other portfolios longer term. So. I think what you're you're seeing through our increased dividend rate and the stock repurchase program is is not a situation that's going to take our aggregate dollars of capital down. I would expect that uh, our strong earnings to uh, pay for the dividends and the uh, stock repurchase and let us maintain or even increase our aggregate level of capital. Now, Tim mentioned that, uh, and, and our management comments mentioned that our $225 million, more or less, of sub-debt we redeemed on July 1, uh, we will probably be back in the market mid-quarter to replace that sub-debt with, you know, uh, somewhat more or somewhat less, depending on market conditions. We'll replace that, we think, at a uh, significantly reduced cost. Uh, but that sub debt will come back on refilling that part of the uh, capital bucket that, that temporarily has gone away from July 1 to whenever we replace that sub debt. But we, we expect our legal limit to go back up. And as Brandon mentioned in his comments, we are seeing, uh, uh, a number of really large complex mixed use projects that are, have phenomenal you know, top of the universe, best in class sponsorship on best in class projects. So I hope you're going to see us doing more uh, of those transactions going forward and, and not less. And I think our legal loan limit, even with the uh, stock buyback and the uh, dividend increase history that we've had, will continue to grow based on strong earnings. Okay, that's extremely helpful. Thanks, George. And then my follow-up question, I guess, is somewhat related. And if I look at, you know, figure 44, it looks like some of those larger um, commitments have been funding up. And then I kind of pair that with, you know, the origination levels that have remained strong. And, and figure 7, where it looks like the, the headwind of prepayment should should normalize as, as you look at 19 and 20 production. So I'm trying to think about how – how the prepayments don't flow down more precipitously. I know you said they, they shouldn't necessarily, but I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that with figure seven and then think about if growth could really return to like the 7% level we saw in, in 2020, or is that um, too aggressive? But it seems, it seems like everything's moving really strongly in the right direction. Yeah, I, I think everything is moving really strongly in the right direction. Of course, you know, typically uh, most, of, most of our deals are sort of uh, – two to four years on the books, three-year average. So, you know, we've still got some carryover from 16, 17, and 18. All of the 14 and 15 originations have paid off now, and almost everything pre-14 is paid off. Several more of those paid off in the uh, in, in the most recent quarter, so we're down to just a handful of pre-14 deals. You know, the 16, 17, and, and 18 stuff is all – uh, ripe stuff to uh, pay off over the next several quarters. And, you know, we're getting into the uh, point where that 2019 origination volume is going to start seeing some sizable pay downs. Next year we'll be kind of hitting the three-year mark on that, and that that's kind of the prime time for deals to be moving out. So we've got to grow origination volume to uh, offset the payoffs. And, you know, if you look at our total origination volume, we were doing that from 14 to 15 to 16 to 17. We're hopeful that when, 
you see 22, 23, and 24, you'll see a nice upward trend in total annual originations, and that's that's what it's going to take to actually grow our outstanding balances is, a, is an increasing uh, volume of originations plus contributions from a variety of other business units. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about how we're positioned to accomplish that at RESG and elsewhere. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So that's great. Congrats on the record quarter. All right. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to CEO George Gleason for closing remarks. Sir? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no other questions, that will conclude our call today. We appreciate all of you being on the call, and we look forward to being with you in about uh, 90 days or so. So thanks. Have a great day. That concludes our call. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.